Recording is on. The grand echo. Um, cool. So uh, glad everyone could make it. Um, this is our September community chat. We're going to be focusing on a topic we're calling defining success for Domain of One's Own. Um, and, and basically, the intention of this is to kind of just um, kind of hear from everybody. Uh, basically, Amanda and I kind of sat down and, and drafted up some some like talking points on um, what people are looking for and in terms of um, analyzing whether something's successful or not. We get, we get questions a lot um, like directed to us at Reclaim of like, hey, um, you know, what metrics should I be looking at? And, and, and then we always kind of end up circling that round to like, well, what do you want to measure? <laughs> like, um, <laughs> so um, I'm kind of always interested in hearing what, um, what people, what people view as indicators of success. And obviously in some level that even comes back all the way around to like, well, what are you trying to accomplish? Right. So um, I, we're going to kind of walk through all that and I'm excited to kind of be able to hear from everyone who can contribute and record this because I do think this could be really interesting, particularly for new schools, but, um, but also um, I think there's also a really cool opportunity for admins who are maybe stepping in who haven't been doing this that long, or maybe they're like revitalizing their offering or things like that. So I, I think this could be kind of cool, cool to hear from folks who are currently doing this or or um, or maybe you're rethinking it yourself on what you look at, what you hope to see, that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, so um, we're gonna basically kind of uh, set this up as, kind of a question and answer um, in a group here. So we'll we'll throw a question out there. I'm going to kind of intentionally like let you all sit with it for maybe a minute. If you want to write down like notes in a pen, pen and paper or in a doc, you don't have to. Um, and then we'll, we're going to kind of share, try to get everyone's responses. Um, you can feel free to unmute at that time or put it in the chat. And that's cool too. Um, and we're just going to kind of go back and forth like that and see where the conversation takes us. That sounds good. So, um, yeah, so we'll start it off. Um, I think the first thing that we have to kind of lay the groundwork with is like, okay, well, why do you have Domain of One's Own on your campus? <laughs> like, why do you have it at all? What was the impetus? Um, and particularly uh, for you, what point did you join that? Were you there since the beginning of Domain of One's Own on your campus, or did you walk into that, or some combination, I guess? Um, so we'll uh, take like a little bit of time to stew on that, 30 seconds, minute, and then we'll have people share. Um, and like I said, mute, um, unmute or chat is totally fine. It would have been cool if I would have had some thinking music to play here, but I don't know how well that would come through on a video call. It doesn't always. You can always sing. There is that a share. I don't want to do that. <laughs> there is a share audio, just audio option ah, in Jitsi, which is nice. Um, I experiment with that. Yeah. Do 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 Ed, you need to be more excited during this talk, please. That's good. Thank you so much. Perfect. That's time, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> so does anyone want to share where they're at? So why do you have Domain of One's Own on your campus? What was the impetus? I know it's kind of a big question. Um, and um, what point were you joining or involved in that process? Well, I'll go first, I guess. Um, sure. So I guess I'm one of the olds, not one of the very first ones, but I was part of our program when we started, uh, geez, January 16. Um, and for those of you who don't know, I'm Jim Luke. I'm with Lansing Community College. And part of our issue, we didn't know what we wanted to do with it. And I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm I'm trying to write up 
uh, a, a book level type thing of what our experiences have been. And so I've been trying to make sense of it because we just kind of launched in as, oh, this is an experiment. It looks interesting to have this capability and we don't know what it would do. Uh, so we didn't have any way of establishing some metrics of really what success would be. We're now, you know, I've been looking backwards and going, so what did, what happened? Uh, or, you know, and how folks have done. And what I've kind of sorted out is that there's, uh, this, there's been five things we've been trying to do. And they would each tend to have different metrics. And uh, actually, what we may need to do is, is, as a school, we probably need to pick, narrow down some of this as to what we really want to focus on. Can't do all of it at one time. But the first one was was that we were just was just literally to be experimental. Was it was a way to bring different uses of technology and different technologies to the question of teaching and faculty. That you know, otherwise everything you had was either you know LMS, or you know you had faculty running off and getting whatever piece of proprietary stuff like. Google Docs that they could bring in and who knew what the heck was going on with any of that stuff. So part of it's just been to experiment and try different ways of doing things in different classes. And like right now we're, we're playing around a lot with just how do you really use perhaps WordPress or uh, now we're even thinking of Mattermost with the cloud for discussion and stuff, try to get past the problem of LMS discussions just suck um, and no one engages in it like they do in the real world social media. Why is that? Is it the media or whatever? So one use is experimental and we kind of measure that by how much weird stuff have we come up with? <laughs> um, not whether any of it succeeds or fails because I expect some failures. Um, the second purpose, and we've actually not done well at this, is the kind of portfolio identity thing that was pushed a lot, and I've heard from a lot. I think I've heard a lot of this from uh, particularly grad schools. Uh, I know our neighbors down the street at Michigan State use their program a lot to establish somebody's identity, and and the original UM Mary Washington, or the U. Mary Washington thing seem to be very oriented towards your portfolio and here's your identity as a person. And um, we've tried that and we've never really gotten, you know, just a simple measure of how many folks do it and have felt interested in, we've just never gotten that going. Um, what we have had a lot of success with is uh, what I would describe as teaching applications. Uh, it's either as a supplemental device to the LMS to let you do, let a professor do things they cannot do in an LMS. Or in multiple cases, we've got faculty that are running off and going, you know what? School says I still have to do the grade book in LMS, but I'm actually running my course and I'm using WordPress as an alternative to uh, the LMS. I know I've done that. I've got, a, there's a bunch of other faculty doing that because, and so we're seeing that grow. And again, the, the key metric for us is um, our faculty asking for it and how many are they doing it? Uh, that's, that's our key metric. The other thing we get a lot of, is, is a way to publish OER. Uh, any kind of OER, whether it's homework exercise, packages, um, we've got our own press books set up on DOO. Um, so we got that. And then the other one is increasing what I would describe as uh, community stuff, um, which is, I've been trying to figure out what this is so that we can come up with a metric. And what I've kind of figured it out is it's 
and this is where maybe where some of the commons in a box stuff fits or some aspects of that it's it's providing an online campus that fills the that big gap i mean schools provide the lms but the lms is just classrooms and then there's oh there's the school website which everyone knows doesn't really involve anybody cuz it's all marketing oriented you know it's it's you know it's it's like where can we provide spaces where student clubs can meet um or do things or do uh, you know do their stuff or where faculty small groups of faculty like you know five folks that teach similar courses can all just put hey let's store our stuff here um you know where anybody can link to it and reuse it and you know and you're not really sure is this an oer what the heck is it type thing um so so those are our five uses is in terms of formal metrics it's mostly just how many folks are doing it in um you know are the when when the site comes up does it stay alive for more than a semester you know i count in other words i count the living after a couple of after a couple of semesters and that's how i'm measuring it so that's what we got cool anyone else want to share um why do you have D domain one zone on your campus what was the impetus where did you get involved um and Taylor, correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't fully understand how it started. I believe it was, I was a student when it started. Um, so I believe it was under our full spectrum learning initiative that was part of our strategic plan. So it was sort of pushed with that as more ways to sort of do teaching. Um, and I started as the pilot program as a student. So that was super cool um, before we even had night domains. Um, and then I've been admining since February. That's sort of my background and how we use it. We love to push portfolios, but really what it's been used for is like class projects. Um, our ed department is doing all the freshmen that come in um, do scholarly blogs and we hope that they continue it. We do have some people that do continue it, so that's awesome. Um, but then like our art program uses that as like, you do a sophomore portfolio and when you're in that discipline and then you do your um, senior art proposal on there. That's how they use domains. Um, and then we have some other classes that use it, some splots and stuff. So I guess as far as measuring it, I sort of keep track of what, domains are used in classes um now that i've sort of ironed out the um, migration like sending out the emails at the end when students graduate sort of how much response i'm getting um is sort of nice i feel like it's been a little bit more than it has in the past still really small numbers but you know that's really small wins so i did have some interest in keeping sites this past spring so that was super cool that i don't think we've had in the past so that's interesting so you're saying like how many responses you get to the email of like hey your site's going away because you've graduated and here's how you can mm -hmm. move that's cool and like reaching out like cool how do i do this um even though we do have instructions but just the reaching out and showing initiative i think is pretty cool yeah awesome um so uh I, I think probably most people in this call, because we can, we have a kind of core community chat group at this point, but um, uh, Annika is at St. Norbert College, and I my last job was at St. Norbert College. Um, and um, I will say, I kind of selfishly, this time around, um, I, I, I noticed when, when those, when you must've sent that email out, cause we got tickets at reclaim, um, from St. Like St. Norbert people I was like, cool. A lot of St. Norbert people right now. Yeah, um, some that. of them literally with SNC emails still, you know, in, in some cases, um, is how I would notice, or, um, of course they're asking us to move their stuff. So we have to know where it comes from. Um, but that was kind of cool to see uh, sort of warm my heart to see too. So, uh, that's cool. And I hadn't really thought of like literally keeping track of that metric of, okay, how many are retiring versus how many people 
you know, want help moving or, or, or whatever. That's cool. Taylor, I'm not sure uh, how you want to manage. I know you have other questions, but I'm just scrolling through the chat and we do have a number of people who've been posting their experiences uh, there. Um, so Jerry is talking about the history of domain of one's own uh, being at uh, University of Mary Washington being worked on by uh, Jim and Martha and Tim um, and some other team members. Uh, Ed talking about uh, um, the SUNY system as a younger initiative working for open publishing and open pedagogy out of the OER movement and also looking at uh, projects that can stand on their own without much help from the admin team. Um, a couple of experimental spaces, uh, sort of like Jim talked about, Mo also mentioned that, um, and uh, also interest coming from staff, campus and student offices, organizations, uh, Shelby mentioned uh, it that U University of North Florida is about five years old uh, and it's a faculty experimental sandbox space, portfolios uh, and online presence, things like that. I think that's covered most of the chat people can add anything that I've missed, but I just wanted to get that out there before we move on or anyone else wants to speak and add something now. Yeah, thanks about it. Um, if anyone yeah, else wants to share. The, the, the thing that I added in the chat, you know, that, that Jim seemed to resonate with him as well was, um, one of the things that I look at that I don't talk about loudly is what projects are there going and going strong that aren't requiring regular handholding from me? You know, wait, is there proof that this is spreading across the campus? For me, the SUNY system, are there people who are like diving in? Um, cause that's, that's going to be a real measure of success for me. Um, Yes, that's exactly it, Taylor. Spreading in a sustainable way. I'm very scared of building things that only one person can do or only a couple people could do because, you know, someone might get a better job. Someone might leave us. And then it's like, okay, does that mean that that disappears from that campus? That that disappears from that culture? Definitely. And I know that I've noticed uh, this summer, not in too many schools, but in a couple, uh, there's been some admin turnover, both in just a few spots and in some schools, most of the team, whether that's because it's a fairly small team or because the project is getting reimagined. Um, and so I think that's always something that schools want to consider. Yeah, I mean, I think that we're, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of um, people talking about vision and measuring, which are questions that we had um, kind of lined up here. So you're all kind of getting ahead of us, which is, which is great. Um, so I guess what I'll, I, I'm going to um, kind of tweak this question a bit and ask, um, you know, more straightforward, if anyone has anything else they want to say specifically about what that vision is for Domain of One's Own and if it has changed. Um, did you start thinking it was that this was going to be about one thing um, and it's kind of transitioned into something else? Um, I know that that has been touched on in some places, but if there's anything anyone else wants to add to that conversation, we'll leave space for it. All right, moving on. Um, so I also have, am appreciating the part of this conversation that is, you know, 
talking about really who this is for. And it sounds like we have a mix of things being, you know, kind of student centered and things being faculty centered. Um, so I guess one of the questions we have is how, um, how do you approach the delivery of this project or this initiative, depending on, you know, whether or not it's student or faculty centered, like what, what are the things that you're doing to bring in your community members um, in a way that resonates with them? Um, and, are, you know, how, what is your administration doing? I mean, Ed, Ed mentions in the chat as well, like what, how does the institution measure success? What kind of backing do you feel you might have from administration? Um, how are you communicating with administration about value and that kind of thing? So. As far as um, supporting it, uh, some of you might be familiar with our tech bar, but that's comprised of students um, that take domains equipment. So then it's really nice because then at the end of the semester, we can take those metrics and be like, this is how many people came in and we supported. Um, so that's sort of nice to have that, I guess, um, besides just the overall metric of this is how many domains are used. Here are the class domains that were used and how many classes used it besides that. And because we do the tech bar appointments, anyone that uses it in a class, I have fill out a form of exactly to get all of the details of so we can support the students that come in the best. So we do have that data and that information. Hi, all. I can talk a little bit about what we're doing at UMW right now. Um, like like Annika said, we also have what we call a digital knowledge center here, which is peer student consultants that do all sorts of digital projects, not just domain of one's own. Um, COVID really slowed things up, you know, in a way that I think our faculty were like, I'm not going to do that right now. <laughs> you know, so like bringing in new users and things like that. Um, you know, at Mary Washington here, I, I started in, you know, took over this group in 2019. And soon after that, we were out. So, you know, we've been rebuilding and rebranding and changing things around. We're actually in the process right now of, you know, Jim Groom's heart and love of UMW blogs, which is a thing he started, you don't know, 14 years ago or so. Um, still running here, but it's becoming quite a lot to manage. So, we're going to archive it and spin up a new multi-site. That's a project we're working on uh, right now so that we can have the tiers, right? So there's lots of, there. you know, I look at, I look at the multi-site as um, the way in that is simpler for some faculty and some students. The other thing that we try to do is package. Right now we're doing, we're doing workshops this fall with our faculty on digital assignments. So just trying to think about, have, have a faculty member understand that, you know, digital learning support, who, which is who I work with, the, like we are, fact, we will help you consult you in um, creating the assignments. And then we will also help you think about how to assess the assignments. We will also help you think about how those, uh, how it might line up to, you know, here we have a general, education requirement for digital and uh, intensive courses. So how do those, how can you take an assignment and line it up to digital intensive uh, student learning objectives? Um, and so, and then we have, uh, we also work with our DKC, it's part of us, right? So then it's like the, the, the faculty does not have to have the expertise to be able to do all the troubleshooting. And that's usually the place where they're like, I, I don't know how to do that. I don't have time for that. It's like, we do that. You know, send your students to us. Ask us your questions, all those kinds of things. So we're really trying to build that, you know, tiered support around everything so that people think that they can actually pull that off. So um, otherwise, I think we find that, you know, if a faculty member feels like they have to have some high level expertise, which they always do because they, you know, don't ever want to look wrong in front of anybody, right? Then you, it, it's hard to get growth. So I think by taking it step by step, 
you know, maybe you start with a blog, maybe you start with some pieces like that. Maybe every students do a blogging assignment. Then you have them like in our, in our common digital studies group, we start to build more and more as far as like they use it for their portfolios, students in computer science, they're building their code and putting it up there, you know, those kinds of things. So it's, uh, it's like anything, it's just a slow uphill march, right? And you just keep going. And, and the biggest thing that you know, that I, that I think to success in this is providing the support around it and making people feel like we got your back and we're not just like, you're on your own. So enough, enough for me, but thanks. More, more. I mean, to piggyback on that, um, I do think support is everything, right? With the domain of one's own instance like building the the pieces that make it work. And then we see it like, you know, the admins and the various folks getting the support they need to do that amongst the other things. So, yeah, I mean, I do think that is the, the best recipe. And on top of that, then how are you going to use it? What will it best fit with your community? But having the support is, you know, we found that with Reclaim. It's not that different, right? <laughs> like people want to be supported in the work they do. Uh. I can see Jim, you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I got kind of a two part question for everybody else here from what I was hearing. And I'm, I'm wondering, um, does the DOO, you know, your program, your effort, uh, how do you put this? Um, I In our place, it's like it came along. It would there was the you know we had I had this idea, and DOO doesn't really fit organizationally anywhere. So like yeah, we get some funding from IT, and we get tolerance from IT, which is about the most we've been able to get. Um, e the formal e learning group has never wanted to touch it, and has actually fought it. And so we're under our Center for Teaching Excellence finally and, and all this kind of stuff. So we've actually had to kind of create this space in the org chart and in the conception of the organization where we live. And so one of my own, in, and so the second part of the question, my first part of the question is, is, is that just us or have others had that kind of, did you fit in somewhere? Oh yeah, this is a normal thing. Um, and the second part of the question is, if you didn't fit in right away, how are you informally measuring or not measuring so much as assessing your own progress and your own health? Um, I guess, you know, and I don't know that I have one good one is I just kind of, uh, for me, it's just been, yeah, how freaked out do I get every year at budget time as to whether or not I'm still going to be here? <laughs> you know, and now that we're actually hiring somebody, I'll be up for two years temporarily. I mean, I'd rather have permanent, but, you know, now I'm feeling like, oh, well, we've at least gotten to, I feel like we've succeeded now because we're accepted that we're here. Um, you know, apologies to the queer community, but I kind of feel like, yeah, well, we're here and we're, you know, we're here and we're we're going to stay um, type thing. Deal with it. So I don't know. What do others think? So, Jim, my position in SUNY, um, you know, I wrote a grant that got the roll, the, you know, the ball rolling and we were piloting a shared infrastructure where there's 64 campuses and I'm trying to recruit other leads. And I was at an institution where I was at that time, part of the IT team. We've since moved into academic affairs, but we're like looking for where would it sit in other institutions? And I saw very frequently exactly what you're talking about. Oh, the center for teaching excellence is like bought into this, but they're having problems with their academic technology department. And so like, I'd like pull aside that lead and be like, hey, this is a touchy subject for some academic technology people. Like, like I would not say this is like 
I would not be going out and being like, forget Blackboard, screw the LMS. Like that, this is going to get you in hot water. This be start start putting into your you know elevator pitch like these are systems that can work integrated together. What belongs in Blackboard? What belongs in an alternative system? How can we coexist and 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 really you know think about that kind of talk? Because some places it's situated in the library. Some places it's in IT. Some places IT wants to make sure it doesn't fall back on them if it breaks. Because a lot of IT departments, I mean, if it runs on electricity, we're expected to support it. And that's frustrating for us. Yeah, and I'll say, like, a lot of IT departments don't appreciate that that's the situation they're in, too. There was a joke that a former coworker of mine at SNC made was like, do you need an IT representative there? Cause they're going to use the lights today. Um, <laughs> so um, th that was, that was a, you know, particularly maybe not great taste joke. Um, but um, I, I will say it's, it's interesting too, because depending on like that has such a dynamic of like where in the org chart it lives, but also, I mean, the org chart doesn't tell all, right? Like that doesn't describe the relationships between the little dots on the org chart um, and, and or the boxes that those dots live in, right? Um, there, there was a point when, when like the, at, um, in a previous role where if, if there was an ultimate question about either the LMS or domain of one's own, I was the, it was the same as me. Right. So um, there were, there were times where I got to leverage that and be like, I don't think you should do this here. Um, and there'd be really, I thought you were the LMS guy. I was like, yes, but also let me turn my hat around. Um, <laughs> you know? Um, and that was, um, I think enlightening for me because I, um, I do a, a really agree, like as much as I personally don't really like like LMSs in general very much, I think there's a place and an ecosystem that all of these tools live together. And I think it's sort of a pathway, right? I think some, some people are gonna start out not wanting to use one or the other at all and need to um, find a combination that works for them, whether they're comfortable in one or the other, maybe they're a new teacher and just need to focus on something. Um, it's complicated, right? But then that also has a lot to do with how you measure these things um, as well over time. Like there, I definitely found myself making some charts with numbers that go up, whether or not I liked, I thought they were meaningful, <laughs> you know, um, because it needed to tell the right story. So. Uh, Ed, you're muted. I just want to add one more thought about like how we talk about the, the sometimes the tension between IT departments and and domains. One of the things that I always say in defense of IT departments is everything that IT runs is too big to fail. If Blackboard goes down for 12 hours, that is a disaster of monumental disproportions. If your individual blog went down for 12 hours, that's sad, but we can fix it and get over it. And so when people come to me and say like, well, IT doesn't do anything and IT won't work with us and everything, I'm like, I always like be like, wait, in defense of IT, everything that they do needs 1000% uptime. And I'm about to teach you some things where you might break this. If you go and like install 15 contradictory plugins on this site, it might go down. But what's cool is we can also fix it, you know? So we're talking about a different scale and a different intention with this project. And that might be one of the reasons why you go back to Blackboard. If that doesn't sound fun to you, I have a nice LMS that has 1000% support. But if you are interested in tinkering and doing something that you couldn't do in the LMS, I've got a space for you too. Ed, first time caller, long time listener. Thanks for calling in. But I did want to say that I, I think one of the things we found dealing with IT departments who often, you know, as we understand running infrastructure and support, right? It can be thankless to be part of an IT department. And I think one of the things, some, not all, but a good amount are fairly happy to say, yep, take our WordPress multi-site or they're seeking us out 
so that they don't have to run that because, you know, some of the tools that we run and host are targets and they are not necessarily always, like you said, high priority. So they aren't able amongst the other things they have to do. So a lot of times it's not as I would say like um, antagonistic for us in IT departments. Like a lot of times they're very happy to have us take over a lot of this stuff and work with that. And so they can focus on those enterprise systems. The integration piece that you're talking about for a variety of reasons is super interesting. And, you know, it's a mixed bag of worms. I mean, Jerry was talking about UMW blogs for over a decade. We didn't do single sign on because we wanted independence from IT department in that we didn't want to have to like, you know, find ourselves being, you know, held to different standards. But at other points, it's it could be really simplifying the process. So that IT department is there's a spectrum there of of working along with the folks. And we're finding like we often have pretty good relationships. And oftentimes they are even on the other side of helping us find stuff that's wrong with our domain of one's own or um WordPress multi-site that we didn't see. And in fact I've become a big fan, right? Like I, I'm very different from my, you know, edu punk days of trying to screw IT. Now I'm like, can you help me with this IT? <laughs> now you are IT, Jim. Thank you, Jerry. I was waiting for you to say something to pound me. You've become the man. Awesome. I think that um, Taylor, what do you, you know, correct me, steer me back if you want to do things differently. But I think that with the time we have left, it, it would be um, most beneficial to talk about our last kind of question, which is, um, especially since we're talking about support. Um, well, let me find the questions. Uh, it is, what do you feel like you need help with from us gathering to uh, tell your story, all the stories you've been sharing with us here, um, to make any cases you need to make or to just assess what what's going on with Domain of One's Own um, in your community. You know, what what do you feel like you're, what pieces are you missing? What, what, what do you, what would be helpful for you that we can start looking into in terms of um, uh, usage and assessment. How hard would it be for you to generate for a campus a support um, report, which said we received blank number of tickets from this, you know, and uh, here are some of the common, you know, problems that people are seeing, and and. Here's my thought process for this. One of the arguments against domain of one's own often seems to be, well, how could you support 500 applications or 500 possible use cases, you know, and, and, and one of the things that I was always surprised at in the first couple of years is how little like broken things I was going in to fix. It wasn't all that bad. So being able to say like, okay, we had like, we escalated 20 tickets to reclaim hosting last year. And here's the kind of things that they were might be a way to track, you know, um, some kind of engagement. Yeah, Ed, I can jump in on this. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, it's always a pleasure to hear um, how Domain of One's Own is going on your campus. Uh, so it's definitely something that we can grab on our end. We have those metrics and can see, okay, how many tickets did we get from the SUNY email addresses, for example? And we can see, uh, we even track metrics on our end to see what types of questions you're, we're receiving, um, you know, even how long those tickets are open, things like that. So that's definitely something that we can provide for you all. Um, just let us know if at any point that's something that you want. I, I will also say too that when it when we talk about supporting domains in general, there's always a conversation between what's offered versus what's supported. And I think that that's a helpful 
uh, distinction to make sometimes um, and something that we definitely recommend thinking through where just because you're offering it and making it available doesn't mean that you can necessarily support every application in-house to the extent that you might support WordPress, for example. So, um, you know, I might recommend saying like, we can offer all of this and all of this is possible and look at the potential of what folks are doing and highlighting the community work associated with that. But know that, you know, right now we have capacity to support your WordPress projects, your Omeka and your Scalar projects and um, everything else, you know, there's a lot of open source documentation and yada yada. So that's kind of been my approach or what I've seen ha has worked for, for some schools, but I'd be curious to know how fo folks are handling the, the support models as well. <laughs> yeah, install a Tron is, I'm, I'm responding to Eric's comment in the I'm responding to Eric's comment and the thing, but install a Tron's kind of nice. And hi, Eric. Well, and, and that's that's kind of immediately what I was thinking about too, based on what Lauren is saying here. Like, I don't know. I haven't, I, like, we definitely offer an installer for Website Baker CMS. I've never heard of it. Um, anyone using it, I mean. Um, and, and like, you know, that that's, um, but I, I was kind of viewed like conversations around that, especially with students and faculty as like itself a valuable thing, right? Because part of, if you're like embarking on a new project, right? Like if you're like, I wanna do something that does this, part of the the thing I was hoping, uh, always hoping that Domain One's Own would um, sort of the process of making something on Domain One's Own would teach people is, some of the skills that you need to get started on that journey of you have to decide on a platform and you know that kind of starts for like students and faculty on whether or not they're even going to use domain one zone they might use something else right based on whatever their needs are right um but um but then application is definitely part of that and knowing like is this something that i can get seek help on and there's a lot of resources out there for me or not maybe this thing isn't get updates very often and there's a very small community so I could use it, but know that if I come in, uh, run up to a weird problem, it may be more difficult to fix. Um, so that, that to me was always kind of a, um, I was always like weirdly happy when I got questions about that. I was saying like, I see that there's Lime survey and I want to use that for forms. And I go, oh, you know, like as an admin, I'd be like, I haven't used that tool, but you should check it out and I'm gonna install it too, and we'll see what we come up with. And I found most often that folks were receptive to that and say like, let's learn together on this when I was an admin. Um, and obviously sometimes people will be like, okay, that's not what I'm, I need something that is, you know, rock solid and gonna do this. I was like, well, maybe you might be interested in the college's license of Qualtrics, right? <laughs> so like, that that is different. Um, the other thing, too, I will say, just kind of in response to Jim, your Luke, your comment in the uh, the chat there, just about um, the ratio of requests that we receive too for support. You know, one of the things that we talk about a lot when you're putting any kind of digital work online, especially as you're associating it with a .edu uh, domain, you, there's always that risk of, you know, what if people are posting something that's risque and how do you handle those types of scenarios, right? And I always, I it's something that I'm always fascinated by. I, I've been with Reclaim for many years and I can't, I think we've received like five copyright takedown notices like ever, you know, <laughs> or, you know, really big issues where students are, you know, have done something that's not okay. And we have to suspend the site and, you know, do damage control. Like that never happens. Um, and so that type of ratio is something that is always good to reinforce too. So, um, Anyway, I uh, just wanted to, to mention that, that that's always uh, a surprising thing for me. I, I think actually just to, to point to that, Lauren, because I think it's funny, we got one of those five MPA recently, and it was because someone had hacked a Scalar account and had put out all of this like MBA course material from a publisher 
had figured out a way to get it in the scalar book and the publisher went after that and it was at a random university and it was a hack for scalar and that was interesting it's like the only people who care about the mpa you know are the ones who have this like course they're selling somewhere and it shows you how broken that system is regardless but yeah like we don't really deal with it on the regular and we don't get complaints from the school which is always telling because that was a huge reason before we started all this to say well, we wouldn't want students to put anything. I mean, how many times, Jerry, you've managed that? Tom, you've managed WordPress multi-sites that are in the tens of thousands of sites. And I bet you could count them on one hand yourselves. It's interesting. Very, And it's underreported how little of an issue that is, frankly. The the other thing I'd say about that is this is, this is all covered under your other policies for your institution anyway. So... Students are going to do what students do, no matter what students are using for whatever they're doing. So um, some of this is just like, yeah, this is a conduct issue that needs to be taken care of. And, and that's how we, we've handled it in the past. And like Jim said, yeah, I, there's, there's only really one that I remember <laughs> that I had to do something about. So. Yeah, and, and to that point, too, it, the concept can also be applied to giving folks the freedom to choose their own domain versus assigning them a domain based off of, you know, single sign on metadata, first and last name. You know, sometimes the concern is that, oh, if we give students the choice to create their own domain, they're going to go out and create something inappropriate. And again, that it never happens. It's just not something that we see. So I always think that that's just uh, a pleasant surprise. I really do wish more people knew that because I've definitely gotten questions about that uh, pretty recently, actually. And I feel like it would be nice for them to know that they can have more trust in their community. Yeah, that is a good point. I thought Taylor, this was going to be a big reveal session because <laughs> you're looking for for data. I mean, this is anyway. A oh, big reveal on some of our projects. Yeah. Um, well, you know that would have made a lot of sense. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, here I can say something that I think would be helpful. Is there some sort of dashboard that I don't have to go and like find a bunch of reports to know who built a new site? Is it getting any hits? Are they creating any new links? Can I look at those links? Can I just have a stream of the stuff that people are doing? Um, uh, because if I have to go out and find all that on my own, I don't have time for that. But if I have a list of just a stream of links, here's everything that's happening in your system, then I can go and randomly look at those. Or if I have an hour, I'm going to go look and see what people are doing now. And that takes me down all kinds of things that actually end up being, oh, student, can I feature you on this page because we want to include this? Or here's something that, you know, here, administrator, look at, look at what our students are doing. It's like that piece is, this is where not having a Jim Groom work for you anymore really sucks because Jim always knew everything that was happening on UMW blogs and would be able to tell us all about it. And that was the thing that helps you understand the value of it and how to sell it and make people understand that, yeah, there's good things happening here. I love I will you too, Jerry. I will say um, some of that stuff. So like um, new sites created and um, for domain one zone, we are working on something to put like account creation stuff and what domain have they picked right, right at your fingertips. And that is something I could demo um, when we planned the, when we announced this workshop, it, I didn't really have anything to show, but now I do. So that's why I was like, it would have been a good thing. Um, but um, one thing that, um, Tom Woodward has been helping me a lot with is this, um, and that is not what I wanted to share. Wrong screen. Great. There we go. Um, so this is state you, and right now we're looking at putting a version of our, um, last logins, uh, report that we have, um, right in the WordPress interface so that you can log in and just search for stuff. So, um, right now I have, um, email. This is very rough at this point. Like I have a lot of changes I need to make to the report. Um, but the actual interface is the is Tom's work, um, and that this I've been really happy with. I think the potential of this to be um, for us to build on this and add more stuff to it because I think 
I've been really interested in reporting stuff basically since, I mean, since before I started at Reclaim really. Um, but I think we, I kind of realized and like the team, we, we realized that like the first thing we had to do is make these things easier to get to because right now um, some folks are very comfortable with like SFTPing CSVs and going through them, but that doesn't work for everybody. And it's certainly not convenient. Um, so this is kind of the first um, step to that is make this stuff accessible. Right now, um, what this does is really just, here's the last time a person logged into uh, Domain of One's Own from SSO. This is their cPanel username. This is their email address. This is the primary domain name on the account. And this is how much disk usage they're using. Um, and I think there's a lot of room to grow from here and do really cool things with it. But I will say right off the bat, it already solves one of my biggest complaints, which is if you are going into Domain of One's Own to try and find out like what people are doing, you can go to the users panel in WordPress, of course, and I'm not, I'm not actually going to show that. Um, but um, but uh, you have no way of knowing what their primary domain is from there, right? Like that is better found from um, WHM or WHMCS. Um, and, but that's not where our, ad, I, I, at least it's not where I was when I was an admin spending most of my time. I was doing most things from WordPress that I think is the most convenient way. Um, so yeah, so there's, there's room to grow here. I, I want to add more stuff to this report, but of course this layout isn't going to work for everything, right? Like this, this won't work and we'll have to come up with probably a different report to do things like include, um, you know, well, what applications are installed on a particular account, right? That that's probably um, my my personal next thing I would want to include is like, all right, can I get a list of like you can find this if you go into WHM and look through Installatron, you can see every installation that Installatron knows about, which is a pretty complete listing, about as complete as you could reasonably get. Um, because I, I doubt very many people, uh, certainly I've never done this, but I don't think many people on Domain of One's Own are like manually installing WordPress and setting up uh, databases. You can do that, but I don't think many people are. Um, but I think that would be the next thing is I would want a really clear, easy to follow report of like, this is every install I try to install. This is the application. This is the user account it's associated with. This is maybe when it was installed. Um, and go from there. And I think, um, Jerry, to your point too, there is unique things that you can do in WordPress multi-site on top of that because it is one WordPress install. And I'm not very well versed in WordPress multi-site, but it seems possible and reasonable to me to know things like what's the last post that's been updated across the entire network. That seems possible. And, you know, um, whereas I think you could do that in Domain of One's Own, but it would be uh, trick because you'd actually have to query every single WordPress site um, in, in the database to check that. Not impossible, but um, but yeah. So I'm I I'm kind of excited to grow that. from here, basically. And we'll 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 be working on rolling out this a cleaned up version of what I just showed to Domain One's Own soon. I don't really have anything to announce because I have to. I'm still working out the details and um, figuring out how we can do this in a clean way. But yeah, I'm excited about it. Can I ask for two things on that? Mm -hmm. One thing, the first thing is a request not to make this dashboard vanilla, but make it a little bit opinionated in that. And, wh and what I mean by that is if you've got filters in there and you think from your experience that a good you know, test that someone has got a completely stale account is that they haven't logged in in a long time and they aren't using very much space, put that button in there, like possible stale accounts and filter two things at once to give me a list of like, hey, these would be some good accounts that would be like good to offload. You know, like you, you we've talked about this in past, there are kind of things that you know by feel and if you could build, bake that into the system to start with, that I think that would be really helpful to me. And then the second request is make it an action dashboard. And what I mean by that is um, if there was a, a column I could click and go mass email, 
right from the same interface so that I could like use it as a communication tool, that would be the tops for me of being able to be like, okay, using this dashboard, I've identified that these 50 accounts are the ones that are most likely to need to be pulled off the system, click the button, do it right from there. Because I was always like, as an admin, I'm still confused about like, okay, I have to pull these eight reports and I get this list of like 50 people I need to do, but then I need to email them from WHMCS and WHMCS has no place to input those email addresses. So now I have to find them again on a list. Like if mm -hmm. I could just email from the place that I'm getting the data or have a possible path forward. Some work, for that, workflow for that. Yeah. Some workflow. That would I really do help. We, we I, do off, oh, sorry, Pilot. I was just going to say really quickly that it wouldn't, it's not in the dashboard right now, but uh, you can download CSV and Excel copies of the full last login uh, CSV from what Taylor and Tom are designing. And you can put filters on them to say, show me last login and storage usage and things like that. So it is an extra step to download that and apply the filters yourself, but that optionality is still there. Yeah. Well, and yeah, yeah of course. So, mm -hmm. the, and, and what I'm hearing from, from that, Ed, is a couple things. So one thing that it doesn't do at all right now, and I don't really have any way at, at this point of knowing how possible or easy is, it would be really nice to you know, I showed that you can search and filter it, but that's just a display, right? So it would be nice to filter it and then get a subset of the data right from the tool and then do something with it, which that gets into the doing something with it part. I think there's kind of two reasonable pathways. And one is, you know, hey, can we come up with really clean and documented ways to get data from here and put it someplace else and do something with it, right? And that may be WHMCS's tool. And I think maybe long, long term, aspirationally, I would like to see some of that happen from WordPress if we're talking like domains API, right? And say like, yeah, you know what? We can use our own API that to, to suspend an account or something like that, potentially. Um, that would be, I think, really cool. But also from like Reclaim's perspective, we have to look at like, all right, are we writing our own WHMCS? Is that what we're doing? <laughs> um, you know, and at what point does that make sense? But um, but, um, yeah, I will say, um, the, the, um, you definitely could, you know, use that report to send us a ticket and say, Hey, I want a contact list in WHMCS of this 50 people. And we can do that. I would like to long-term again, I don't know how easy this would be yet, but I would like to put that in admin's hands of saying like, you have a way to just feed this into WHMCS instantly. Um, not because we get a lot of requests, actually. I mean, I'm we we don't, but I just I know as an admin, it's always nice when I can just click the button and see it happen, right? Um, so um, when when I was at SNC, I had a script that I wrote against the WHMCS API that did just that, but it was not something I would put in anyone else's hands with any confidence because it was because I'm a really bad programmer, basically. So, um, so, but I think there's maybe a path for that, right? Of saying like, hey, you can get data out of this tool and it will be picked up by this script and make a contact group for you. And, and, and there you go. Um, I think that's possible. I think that would be super helpful because, you know, once you have that in WHMCS as a, a contact group or actually their um, is it customer client. group, it's a client group right client now. Group. We do have a script that our infrastructure team can run to bulk add folks to that. So you can say, email everyone in this client group, and then you can go back and say, okay, this client group from September, 2022, you know, let's, communicate with them in December and let them know that, okay, now we're going to terminate accounts or something like that. But I agree with you, Ed. I think, you know, um, it's another place to, to check and it's another place to do stuff. And um, WHMCS is by no means glamorous and being able to do some of that in WordPress would certainly be cool. Yeah. And even if it's not in WordPress, if it's just the ability to mark them as part of that client group from WordPress, and then I can log out and go into WHCMS and write the email, like sure, it, 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 there could be half measures there that do exactly what I'm asking for, right? Yeah, that would be that that would be something I'd be really interested in too. Um, the other thing, stale accounts, um, and 
this is probably my own partially my own hang up, but I get very weird about, I don't know. I'm pretty sure again, this is my opinion maybe, and maybe only mine, but I don't think there is a single metric that you can determine a stale account. Um, but it of course is personal and depends on your project too. Like if you look at, um, there's a whole class of people using um, Domain of One's own who have no Installatron installs and maybe like 10 to 20 megabytes of disk usage because they're writing things static HTML. And it's a really fast website. And guess what? A really fast website that's a small website probably doesn't have much more than maybe 50 megabytes of stuff for, for a particular thing. Um, so that gets tricky. And then you can look at bandwidth, but like is a low bandwidth site an abandoned site? Not necessarily, you know. So I think... <sighs> I like I think there's maybe a combination of metrics that could reach you to to like hey this is a stale site and I I will say the way um I had done it one time that I was pretty happy with and this is super uh it was pretty manual is I like got a report I went to like the subdomains area in WHM and said like tell me about every subdomain and then I got screenshots of everything uh using an automated tool uh, to, to take all the screenshots. And I looked at them and I was like, oh, this, these sites are only hello worlds. So, okay. And these sites are only, you know, white blank pages essentially. Um, but obviously that was a visual look on my part. So that wasn't perfect either at all. Um, but I think there is some combination that could be really cool. Um, and, and, yeah. And if it gives me a list of 50 sites and 47 of them are correct, I think that's exactly. a pretty good ratio. Yeah. Because you can learn those. Oh, this is a bad memory makes static sites. Now I know that. I'm really glad I know that. And I can keep track of that in my head. Yeah, I do. Th I And so maybe it's really just about how that's labeled, right? Um, maybe it's, it's hey, you know, a label Potential. or a badge or something that says, this is a low bandwidth, low storage usage, no installs site. Might want to look, or uh, account. Might want to look at it, you know. Cool. Awesome. Well, we are over time, so um, I'm going to kind of cut it off there. But thank you all so much. I think this was such a great conversation um, and really appreciate your time. And you will be hearing from us again soon with some more on this. Stay tuned. Thank you all for coming. Well, Good to see you. Yeah. Bye bye, Thanks, everyone. Bye.